I am Tessa Chatterton Shaw. I happen to be a, a friend of Pat Fitzpatrick Hearts. In fact, she was my she was my mother's um, good friend at school here in Barbados. And over the last few years, we reconnected and I'm very proud to be to have this privilege. Is everyone hearing me? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really proud to have this privilege of recognizing her work, um, her book in the crook of the frangipani tree. Um, I, I believe that um, at 80, well, she wrote this book last year at 82 years young, and she is an inspiration to me, and I hope, hopefully, she'll be an inspiration to many others. Um, before I introduce Pat formally, just let me tell you that the music that you've been hearing is by a young woman whose name is Samara Joy. And her music sounds so much like Sarah Vaughan. And I'm so impressed. I had never heard of her before, but this was Pat's choice to have Samara Joy. So I wanna welcome all of our guests, especially the author, Pat Fitzpatrick Hart. Um, Pat, are you with us? I am. Yes, and Dr. Henderson Carter, who is um, head of the history department at the Cape Hill campus of the University of the West Indies here in Barbados. And uh, we could not do this without um, the technical expertise of Graham Bell. So I want to acknowledge those individuals. Um, without further ado, just let me say that Pat lives in cold Montreal. I'm not sure what temperature the temperature there is, um, but Pat is um, left Barbados in 1958. She had this dream of moving to another world, a cosmopolitan world, and the Frangipani tree was her haven, the place where she dreamt about life in another place. And she would eventually move to Montreal, Canada. In terms of her academic credentials, she has a master's in counseling psychology from McGill University. She has a bachelor of arts in community nursing from Concordia University. And she is a registered nurse. She has done a lot of work in psychology and psychotherapy. And um, I mean, her list here is impressive, but one thing I would like to acknowledge is that she was very helpful to my own sister um, who attended Concordia University and started university on crutches, having had a car accident. Um, so I, I want to move right along quickly and um, say that Pat is, Pat inspires me to write my own book, um, but we want to hear from Pat in, in terms of what in the crook of the Frangipani means to her, um, the back story. Um, she highlights a lot of interesting things about daily life and those cross-cultural connections between the tiny island of Barbados and then her relocation 
to cosmopolitan, the cosmopolitan city of Montreal. So Pat, I hand over to you. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to this. I am so thrilled to be here. And um, I mean, it's beyond my wildest dreams, to tell you the truth. Um, how should I start? Um, this is my little office here. And as you can see, I keep a little frangipani around all the time because it is my little mantra. Um, I'm very thrilled to be here with everybody and seeing some of my friends and writing has been very, very um, comforting for me. I have drawers full of things that I've written and I'm very grateful to my writing group, the present writing group that I've been a part of for encouraging me to, to, to publish because um, I've been in many writing groups, but, but this one is particular, has been particularly supportive. And I think some of them are here. Some of my old friends are here from nursing and from uh, Nova Scotia. One of my first um, um, classmates, I couldn't go home to Barbados on vacation after my first year of training, couldn't afford it. And I went to Anne's home in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. There are many, many kind people all over the world. So I think, um, I don't know, would, um, would do you want me to continue and read a little bit? Or um, I think it would be really um, to, um, yes, you wanted to hear about the Frangipani tree. Yes, I used to sit in the tree. And, yeah, and I, I think it would be important. Going I over think, ahead. I think it would be important for you to tell us what inspired you to, to write this book, especially at 82. Well, to publish it at 82. I've been writing all along. I have oh, stories. Okay. I have stories from, from 70s, 80s, every, every, every um, pang that I went through, good right. and bad, I would record. And, and so it's only been lately that I've had, um, you know, the, the confidence to, to actually, you know, publish. So, so I'm sure everybody um, my age, you've got lots of memories and, and uh, experiences and you can start recording, you know. So um, I don't know. Maybe Dr. Carter wants to say a few words about a little background um, Barbados history before I do a couple reads, or would you like me to do a read now and then he can give us a little um, Barbados historical background? You go I ahead, you go ahead. I you think ahead, you, had, you had chosen, you had chosen two specific exactly. regions, so right. I think. Okay. So the, show, I, the, show, the show is yours. <laughs> okay, I will start with um, the piece. It's called Black Granny Magic. Um, Granny was my mom's mother, a tiny little black lady. And she was the only granny I ever knew. Her name was Fedora Fleming. And when we grandchildren would teasingly call her Fado, she would smile and tell us that we were highly disrespectful. She lived in the city on Roebuck Street, which was crammed with homes, shops, a gas station, a drugstore, and a bakery. Granny was not everyone's favorite. No wonder. Widowed in her 40s with seven children under the age of 13, she did not spare the rod. Corporal punishment, especially for the boys, was part of their daily bread. Later in life, she was stuck raising grandchildren, mostly boys, my very favorite cousins. It was only much later that I learned of the painful experiences that some of them had endured. For me, the stopover at her house was always good for a lot of fun, a glass of lemonade and a sweet biscuit. I love to hang out on the second floor veranda and watch the happenings on the bustling street below. I'd see lorries laden with bags of sugar lumbering their way to the deep water harbor. 
and many Morris cars honking their way through the traffic. Men on bicycles with zigzag down the busy street, ringing their bells and calling out to each other to speed up or get out of the way. Rickety donkey carts filled with bags of sweet potatoes and yams rattle their way down to the market. And then there were the sweaty pedestrians on their way to who knows where, some loudly greeting each other. How you doing, man? Too hot for me today, man. Lord have his mercy. What a slice of life, a tableau of humanity, awash in bright sunlight. My nostrils would be assailed by the pungent smells of gasoline, tar, sweat, animal droppings, and the sweet aroma of fresh coconut buns from Zephyrin's Bakery down the street, a bakery that still exists in Barbados. I Googled it for over a hundred years. Good stuff. I think that Granny always liked me, and one of my favorite memories was going there after school. One day she greeted me at the door and if, asked me if I wanted to buy some peanuts or sugar cakes from Rosalind, the sweetie lady down the street. Rosalind sat there every day with her tray that held an enticing assortment of pink and white coconut sugar cakes, ginger cakes, little paper bags of peanuts in the shell, and bunches of tamarinds, ackies, or dunks, whatever was in season. I decided on peanuts. Granny then asked me if I had any money. I said, no. Oh, she said, well, let me see if I can find some. She proceeded to pat her dress pockets and look in her bosom area, nothing. She then started to feel around in the little plaits in her short kinky black hair. Suddenly out came a five cent coin. Her eyes widened in surprise. Oh, look what I found, she said. I knew it wasn't magic, but it felt like it. It was love, pure black granny magic. Famous granny quote to any grandchild who was misbehaving in any way. Behave yourself. Go sit down and read a book. And this from a woman who could not read or write. Thank you, Granny. So that's my first reading. Lovely, Pat. Thank as you. I, as I listen to you, memories, and I guess I, I am from a different generation, but certainly memories of the sights and songs of Bridgetown um, resonate from that piece. When you, when you talk about the bustling, um, you know, the busyness of Bridgetown, I think you mentioned the careenage, um, all of which is very, has been transformed right now. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anyone has any questions or any comments, but somehow that flavor of, of Barbados of yesteryear rings through deeply in your book. And I find that very powerful. I also believe that the, it, the connections between Montreal and Barbados, um, certainly my, as I said earlier, my sister and I both studied there. Um, the connections between Barbados and Montreal have been deep. Um, Barbadians started going to McGill University probably in the 40s and 50s. So I see this book as also a, a, a demonstration of the cross-cultural um, connections between the two places. A tiny island with um, 300,000 people now and um, a cosmopolitan city, a French-speaking cosmopolitan city where I I lived at one point, so it resonates with me as well. Um, so let me not do too much talking because um, I don't know if you want to move into the second piece. 
or if anyone has any questions. I would like to hear from Dr. Carter, because that would, that would really please me, giving me the historical background um, of my time, because when I was growing up in Barbados, you know, I had a very good education, Queens College, this is my school pen. I'm very, very, very grateful for my excellent education at Queens College. And um, I, when we were taught history, we were taught history of England and France and wars. We did not have the, the benefit of a good understanding of the history of Barbados. Dr. Carter is a master in that and a prof and, and that's his field. And I would welcome um, a commentary from him. So thank you, Dr. Carter. Well, good night colleagues, good night to everyone here and the persons from Barbados, Canada, and of course around the globe. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with uh, this distinguished audience and to launch this text, this very important text in the crook of the Fanjipani tree, which in my view is a wonderful, intimate, autobiographical composition of seven chapters and 147 pages. I want to assure you that it is a good, easy read. You can sit down in your, uh, on the train or in a plane or at the beach or by the lake and read it. And it is, it is small, it is handy. It uh, goes into your pocketbook and very, very easy read. Now, this book centers on the author's experiences here in Barbados, in Montreal, of course, her many visits back to Barbados, especially as her mom and dad got old. It is a very good examination also of Pat's life as a child of Barbados, in Barbados, a nurse in Canada, a counselor at Concordia University, a therapist, and indeed a writer. Now, I want to make about six or so points about the book. And then, of course, we open the discussion um, even further. Now, first of all, I want to recommend the text because, in my view, it is a good social history of Barbados in the 1940s and 1950s. And... It is social history, not at the level of the society, but social history at the level of the individual, the level of the person. And I want to underscore that because sometimes when we write, we talk about, we give the statistics, how many people live in Barbados, we, we, we give all the data, but what is missing a lot of the times from that social history is how people lived, what they did from day to day. And this book that sets the story in the Fanjipani tree, in the crook of the tree, gives us that very important glimpse of the social history of the person, of a middle-class person growing up in Grandview, just above Shop Hill in the 1940s and in the 1950s. And that is what we need as a society for people to show, to share their personal social histories. Um, sometimes we get it a little bit um, on CBC TV with Sherwood McCaskey's show in the community or in my community. But I think this is wonderfully done here in this text to give us a good understanding of what life was like growing up in the 1940s and in the 1950s. And I want to quote from page 26 of the book 
where Pat talks about loneliness. And here is a family living in a, in a plantation house setting and they are they're close, but yet not close enough to Jackson and Shop Hill and those communities in the area. And she underscores the point about loneliness. And this is what she says, and I quote, I took to reading. I would head to the window seat in my bedroom. It overlooked the sloping graveled driveway lined with huge mahogany trees. I pray for visitors, strangers, lost souls, anybody at all to come driving up to the house. End of quote. So in this text on page 26, there is this idea of loneliness. Yes, you have a, 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 um, a middle class background, but then there is certain deficiencies because you are not necessarily connected with the plant, the, the, the villages around the plantation. The second point I want to note is that the book underscores the significance of the kitchen garden. Now, in the 1940s, right through to the 70s, the kitchen garden in Barbados was the thing that fed the family. The kitchen garden was the thing that sent school many people. And in this book, Pat says how she got $50. You know, her mom would send this money and a lot of this money came from the proceeds of the sale of a variety of items from the kitchen garden. Cabbages, beets, thyme, parsley, sh chives. Now, this is an important point because during the COVID days, when COVID was at its height, people were making the point that we need to get back to the kitchen garden. In other words, creating these small garden plots along around the house instead of just cultivating grass. So this is a point of note. And that kitchen garden was a feature of most Barbadian homes, upper class, middle class, and lower classes. Now, in addition to the, the idea of the kitchen garden, you have a treatment, Pat gives treatment to the gardener. And this is very important. The gardener by the name of Verdi is treated. And she talks about how he comes to the house, how he's meticulous in his gardening and how he you know, talks to, to, to her mother. And tragically, the book tells us about how he died of a heart attack while keeping the home, while the family was um, overseas. But the key here is that the text does not leave out the gardener. And I want to congratulate Pat for making sure that Verdi, the gardener, was included and that relationship uh, was underscored. I now want to move on to the other point about Bajan, the Bajan experience. And this is afternoon tea, tea at four o'clock. And this is important because this idea of afternoon tea stayed with that for a while because even when she went overseas, as the book says, this idea of afternoon tea was also there. But I'm really excited that there is good coverage as well on Robot Street. Robot Street with Granny Fedora Fleming. And Robot Street was a bustling street. It is not what it is today. In other words, today it is dead. 
there's not a lot of activity, but at Robert Street in the 1940s was a place where the provision merchants excelled. <clears throat> Those were the merchants where um, who who credited items from the commission merchants, and in return, they sold to the shops. So some of the big merchants on Robert Street were people like James A. Tudor, who had over 50 shops throughout the country. Even R.L. Seal started at Robert Street. So that the, when you, you go through Robert Street, their cars, their trucks, their donkey cars on both sides of the road. So she is right when she captures that story of Robert Street. And indeed, um, she stole my thunder a little bit because I was going to quote that story on page 36, where she talks about men on bicycles zigzagging down the busy street, uh, ringing their bells and calling out each other to speed up or get out of the way. Rickety donkey carts filled with bags of sweet potatoes and yams rattling their way down the, to the market. That is authentic Robert Street in the 1940s and 1950s. As a matter of fact, even up to the 1970s, that was the character of Robert Street. What killed it was the introduction of the supermarkets in Barbados, where there was no need now for the provision merchants. And a lot of those provision merchants went out of uh, business. And then at the same time, the shopkeepers, a lot of the shops that were fed and serviced by the provision merchants also went out of business. And then she takes us on a journey to the grandstand at the garrison. And she does it in at least two chapters where she talks about going down to the grandstand on Saturdays and watching the races. And, and, and the races are important to Barbadian culture. They're still important. As a matter of fact, people still go down to the garrison these days. And now there is night racing. Um, you know, they can go at night. But the point is that the garrison savannah was an important place for that recreational activity. Um, cr cricket was another area as well. And people would go to, to the Mecca or Casa to Noble to watch cricket. The second major point I want to make has to do with her transition moving to, to Canada, and that gets equal treatment in the book, so that the book gives equal treatment to the Barbadian experience as well as the Canadian experience, where she um, practices nursing, where she becomes a counsellor, um, the issue of divorce is dealt with and its impact, and then there are several chapters where she returns home to mom and dad as they got older. And there is this, this um, returning and making sure that all is well with mom and dad. One of the things that I like about the text are these moments of tragedy, these moments of fun, near misses. You will find towards the end of the text, there is a, 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 almost a boat accident. And Pat is there in the mist with her friends and she narrowly avoids running into other boats um, while they're in Canada. But I want to say thirdly, that the reader gets a good view of the author's experiences. And there's no attempt to hide the social experiences in the day-to-day -day life of the author. Her bat battle with the loss of skin color is treated. Her 
the impact of divorce is treated. Victor's funeral at St. Michael's Cathedral is treated. And, 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 and I love that, that part of the book that talks about the funeral. And here's Pat coming back home, representing the family because mom and dad are too old now to go to the funeral. And she has to represent the family at St. Michael's Cathedral. And she's there having not been back home for a while. And people are there as well. And she's looking around and she, she weaves the story in a, in a very exciting uh, manner looking at that scene at St. Michael's Cathedral at Victor's funeral. And that, to me, um, suggests good writing. And as you have heard, Pat is indeed a writer. And she draws you into that story. And, and you could almost feel as though you are there, sitting in the benches that afternoon as people are fanning away and it is hot. And you almost feel as though you are there. Fourthly, and I'm going to make, I have two other points to make. But the fourth point is that the book illustrates quite well the value of friendships. Friendships with Suzanne, Pat, Jeanette, Martin, Greta, and even Midnight, the cat. And those friendships are illustrated with reference to dinners, parties, weddings, afternoon tea, supper by the lake. And those are friendships that really make life worth living. The book illustrates that, that value. And I'm sure that when you read it, you will see the point that I'm making. The text also gives us a snapshot of Bayesian and Canadian institutions. So when you read it, you get an understanding of how those institutions work. For example, you get a snapshot of St. Michael's Cathedral with Gerald Hudson on the organ and the choir boys. And Gerald Hudson is, you know, fit, uh, one of our best organists in Barbados. And he's wild, he, he was widely um, honored for his work um, at St. Michael's Cathedral. You get also a glimpse of Queen's College in colonial times while it was at Constitution Hill. Some people call it Constitution Road, but there's a little hill there. And then you get an understanding of the women's shelter, the Ches Doris Women's Shelter in Montreal, where she did good service. An understanding of her work at Concordia University. And of course, the Garrison Savannah. So we have a good comparison of the Bayesian institution or, and the Canadian institution in the text. And it also draws comparison to the climatic variations in the two countries. For example, you have rain in Barbados, and Pat describes the various types of rain that, you, that she witnessed in Barbados. The drizzle, the sharp shower, and then the, the rain that suggested a storm or some tropical wave. And that is contrasted with snow in Canada and the cold, the bitter cold um, and, uh, in Canada. So that contrast is inter interesting, especially for Barbadians who sometimes get upset when the rain falls or when the sun is too hot, to understand that in Canada, it is bitterly cold. And then the book ends in a very interesting way. Now, 
we hear how it begins. It begins with Pat in the crook of the Fangipani tree. Now, for a lot of people, a lot of people did that in their boyhood or, or, or um, early days. I did it, certainly. I used to go up into a plum tree and there I would talk to myself and meditate, etc. But here is Pat in the Fandry Pani tree. But she ends it with a beautiful story of the avocado, sharing a slice of the ad avocado. And this was the best avocado tree in the garden. And the, the family would reserve it for themselves. I believe this was the sweetest avocado. And they would reserve the avocado for themselves. And one avocado was left. The family cut the avocado in four. And Pat is eating her dinner. And she leaves the avocado for last. And here comes a family friend our friends, and mom instructs her to share her slice of the avocado with the family friend. And Pat, not upset, allowed that avocado to be shared. And that is a fitting end to that story. It brings the story together. Now, I want to conclude by making three points. First of all, I want to commend Pat for sharing this story with the world. Not many people want to share their stories, especially stories that may be painful. And Pat, I commend you for sharing this story with Bajans, with Canadians, and sharing it with the world, and being brave enough to come out and share your stories. Secondly, it is an invitation for others, some in Canada, some here in Barbados, to share their own stories as well. And all of us have stories. And this is an invitation for others to share, because this is how societies are built. This is what we call the nation building process, where we share the story, and that story is read by people, and people learn from those stories. Okay? So it is a learning experience for our youth. It is a learning experience for middle-aged people. And it is a learning experience for past contemporaries. So that every story, in every story, good or bad, there is a learning experience. And that is how we build a nation. If, on the other hand, we hide our stories and keep our stories to ourselves, then we are poorer for it. So this is a challenge, therefore. This is a challenge to write our stories. This is a challenge to begin the process. And I am sure that there are lots of people who would help you to write it. Because some people are afraid that they will make mistakes. Some people, <clears throat> some people are afraid that their English, their language <clears throat> is not um up to standard but i assure you that there are people who would help you to write your story and imagine all 40 of us here on this call writing our stories you know how rich our nation would be when we share those stories and that is how we build a nation so i want to close by saying to Pat that I commend you for being brave enough to share all of your stories. And this is a book that is easy reading, but not only easy reading, enjoyable reading, and meaningful reading, reading that can impact 
on lives and impact on relationships. So I want to say that I commend highly this book and um, I pray that all of you will go out and buy this book for Christmas, but not only one, but two of them so that you can share it, that you can share it with others um, as a Christmas present. It is authentic. It is not just fiction. It is not just a story that um, has no grounding. It is a story with a grounding here um, in St. Thomas. It is a story with a grounding in Montreal. It is a story of traveling. And that story grips us when we read it. So I want to thank you, Pat, for giving us your story. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Oh, my gosh. This is, um, if, if I would have heard this, um, your critique, I would have been writing a lot earlier in my life. I would have started earlier. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, um, it means a lot to me. Um, more than I, I had even imagined. I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very touched with, with all of the references that, that, that you uh, have, um, you've made. Thank you. Thank you. You're oh welcome. my goodness. Um, I, I want to say, um, before I continue, um, I want to say a special hello to my friend Greta. Um, I hope you can hear me. Greta's been my very close friend since we went to school together. And I, I, Pat, I just want to interrupt and say that yes. her daughter is with us, Suzanne. I know, but I want Greta to make sure that Greta hears my voice too. And her, I think her son's going to be with her. So I wanted to, to ensure that. And, um, and also, um, you know, special hello to Helena, a schoolmate. Hey, Aunt Pat, Aunt Pat, mommy is here and she's listening. Oh my gosh. She's listening. She's does right she now that, here with her. Does she know that it's me? Yes, yeah, she does. She knows that it is you. I agree <laughs> She, she's getting some medication now, but she, she she knows. I'm just wanting to let you know that I'm here with her so she could hear the entire thing. And thank I know you. it means a lot to you. Thank you, thank you. You're so welcome. Greta, Greta has been my best friend since we were 13. Her daughter, Suzanne, she's my godchild whom, whom I've neglected all of her life. And, and her son is one of the... Um, is the, the, the media guy um, making this possible. And I knew him before he was even a thought. So that's Graham. Thank you, Graham. Uh, this is a very overwhelming evening. I mean, this is uh, Dr. Carter. Thank you very much. Um, okay. I think um, my next piece is, is going to be, um, I'll read a piece. And um, this is, pardon me? Say what the pieces are, why you chose it. Yeah, well, I'm, I've chosen this piece. It's on, on vitiligo because, I mean, vitiligo is, is, you know, part of me at this point. Um, so let me explain. My eyes are brown and once upon a time, so was my skin. Growing up in Barbados, product of the multicolored union, my mother was mulatto and my father was beige, I started life in a caramel colored wrapping. Variation in skin coloring is typical in the Caribbean. Today, 99% of the population is some shade of black. The historical blending of Arawak, Carib, and Spanish, Portuguese, French, English settlers and let us not forget the slave trade, hard labor on sugar plantations. In my thirties, my caramel color was slowly replaced by unsightly white patches, first on my face and hands, 
and arms and legs, and then all over, always symmetrically. What an interesting organism the human body is. Mine in particular, due to some genetic quirk in my family, had lost its ability to produce melanin, a substance that produces color. It's called vitiligo. It's an autoimmune affair. Michael Jackson had it, you remember. Now I'm a grandmother. I'm about 90% white, whiter than my white friends. At least they're still producing melanin. But you know, in retrospect, Vitiligo has fashioned a very interesting and colorful life journey for me. It's been a life journey that has caught me, taught me many life lessons. When my spots first appeared, I was a young mother working as a nurse at the university, very much in the public eye. I was very self-conscious. People looked at my hands, but they usually said nothing. Strangers would stare curiously. Children, inquisitive and without guile, would try to touch my spots while their mothers tugged gently on their hands. I would encourage them to touch the spots, assuring them that they didn't hurt. I think to myself, how subtle are the ways in which we shape our children's thinking, how easily we transmit our judgments and our fears. My insecurities centered on the unspoken curiosity of people around me and how I felt I was being viewed. I felt ashamed and I tried to conceal my spots as much as possible. No more sleepless stops exposing my beautiful brown skin. Long sleeves became my uniform, summer and winter. Covering face spots with makeup was tricky and time consuming and eventually I stopped that charade. Who was I kidding? The spots were visible. Over time, my mindset slowly shifted to being authentic. Here I am, take it or leave it. What you see is what you get. As a child, I remember seeing a man who had turned white. His hair, his skin, and even his eyes, whiter than any of the white people I knew. I'd seen him begging downtown wearing a floppy hat, some parts of his skin burnt red by the blazing tropical sun. I remember feeling sorry for him and wondering what had happened to make him all white, even though his family was black. My mom said that we had to be kind because his vision was also affected and that eventually he would be blind. He's albino, she said. Sooner or later, we all have something. We just need to be thankful for what we do have. Her powerful words of wisdom, I would later recall and treasure. And do you know that they are now making dolls? My daughter gave me this doll last Christmas. And I have named her Inez. She is named after, this is my mom's middle name. So um, Inez is now one of my little friends. So I just thought I'd share that with you as well. My son also has vitiligo, it's in the family. And we all, we, we all have something and we live with it. And that's my second reading. And um, I'm happy to answer questions, comments. It's been um, a, a very emotional and wonderful evening. And um, I want to thank you, Tessa, for organizing this. You are an organizer par excellence. And Dr. Carter, I think you're gonna go on my payroll. <laughs> I would also like to say, um, I don't know if Fran is watching, but 
No, she she had problems with her internet. Ah, okay. He's well aware of what's going on. Perfect. Yeah, Tessa has a friend whose name is Fran. And, and um, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> and um, sorry, that my daughter's taking the phone. Yes, um, Fran loved Fran Japani and was very touched. And I sent her a book, um, which she enjoyed. So thank you for that, Tessa. So I'm happy to answer any questions. I hope um, it's been, um, I think David has a question. Uh, yes, um, yes, Pat. Um, what inspired the title of the book? Um, I don't think that was mentioned. Oh, okay. Um, I used to sit in the Frangipani tree in front of our house and, um, I would, it, the tree, we lived on a hill and it was wind blown and it had um, a, a branch that was curved and you could sit in that and I could jump down from that. Um, and I would sit and watch planes going overhead, going to the airport, flying out of the airport. I'd wonder where they were going, um, who was coming in, would I go somewhere one day? We weren't rich, we had land in the kitchen garden. Well, it wasn't ours, but you know, but we didn't have money to, to go, um, you know, overseas to study big time. And um, I just used to dream, like, what will happen to me one day? Will I go anywhere? Well, you know, I just knew um, because of my mother's influence that education was important, that um, having a good education just gave you, um, it just gave you legs to stand on in the world. And, and so that, that was a lesson that um, I learned from her and she learned from her mom. And um, I think it's, it's been a lesson that's been passed down to, to some in the family. Of course, not everyone in every family um, gets lucky, let's say. And um, we all know that, yeah. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I would say so, yes. Okay, thank you. Actually, D David is a journalist, so I'm very happy that David Hinkson is here. Okay. Yes. Are there any questions, any other questions? Just to sort of follow up on the question um, that was put just now, I just want to make the point that it was commonplace um, for young boys and girls in the 40s and 50s to climb trees. Nowadays, that has gone through the window. You don't find a lot of young people climbing trees anymore or exploring gullies and grass pieces, etc. So that for me, as a young boy growing up in St. George, which is not far from St. Thomas, I used to climb trees too. And my favorite tree was the plum tree. And I would have a, a, an area in the plum tree where I could sit down freely and eat plums and, of course, sit down and relax. There were other people whose um, tree was the Aki tree. Okay? So that um, that was something that Barbadian boys and girls look forward to. And even if you were a girl, you still would climb a tree as well. So, so those are things that really uh, tell us what we have missed growing up and what really makes social life so interesting, these things that we have missed. So life has changed tremendously. People no longer climb trees. People no longer frequent the gullies except the hikers. But in our day, that was a major thing, going exploring the gully or going exploring the hill. So I, I, I'm glad that Pat um, references the Frangipani tree and references that um, moment or those moments where she would go up there and sit down and dream. So thank you very much for that. 
Thank you. <laughs> well, it's been wonderful, Tessa. Well, bef before I, I say thanks, I just wanted to give the opportunity to anyone else who wanted to make any comments, add value. I see Maurice with his hand up. So if you could just unmute. Yes, uh, I wanted to say that um, Pat is in a writing group uh, and um, she is still writing. She lives right across the street from a park and uh, she sits on her balcony like she's watching a play and she has an amazing eye for noticing things. And uh, this is her strength. She has a writer's eye. And that's all I want to say. I would respond. Um, Morris is our, our venerable writing group leader. <laughs> I've been with that group for about um, seven years now. And um, since COVID started, um, I've been writing what I call my COVID chronicles. And, um, and I submit those to my writing group every, um, every two or three weeks. And that writing has actually helped me to survive COVID. You know, I haven't traveled a lot. I don't go out that much. I really kind of um, lay pretty low. And um, um, writing, um, is is nourishment it's nourishment for me it really is yeah thank you pat um, anyone else any other comments yes i i want to say to pat that i want to steal your idea of a <laughs> writing group for barbados because it is something that would help us as a country going forward we have groups but we have drinking groups groups that would go to the rum shop and drink and that sort of thing we have people who would go to church these are church groups people um, who would go to choirs etc that's good but not a lot of people want to sit down and have a writing group and it is fabulous to have people sitting down writing their stories and as you said it is good nourishment for the brain okay and it is something that would help us. Just recently, you know, we here at the university started a program called Today in Beijing History, which is a radio program. And some of our um, colleagues at the university said to me, look, this, because you have to write a program every day, you have to write a script every day. And one colleague said to me, well, not one, but other colleagues as well, more than one that this has helped me to be a better writer. And just by writing every day, just by writing a, a hundred words every day, he said, this has helped me to be a better writer. And I want to borrow that idea or take it here to Barbados and see how we could implement it, a writing group, to get Barbadians writing and putting pen to paper, et cetera. I believe it will help our society. I believe it will help individuals. And I want to say to you, Morris and, 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 and Pat and the others, keep writing and keep spreading the word, okay? So I'm happy that you've started this and I'm pleased to be able to steal your idea for Barbados. You can start a group, uh, Dr. Carter. Yeah. There you go. Henderson, I, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that because I often wondered if there was such a group here in Barbados because I have found myself in a situation where I have promoted the, the work of two authors Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Let me just mention a Barbadian, Wilmont Sincere, who wrote two books. Um, they are different in the sense that it's non, what, what, what he calls fictionalized writing. So he's taken historical elements of Barbados, but 
transform them into fiction. And then pop. And uh, now I say to myself, Tessa, it's time mm -hmm. for you to start. You're next. I'm next. Mm -hmm. um, are there any more comments, um, questions before I wrap up? But I, I would like to give, I, I noticed members of Pat's family here, and I'm so pleased to see so many Fitzpatrick's and um heart my daughter and, my son yes and uh, that family support is so important very good and um, well, maybe merly cumberbatch merly from barbados she's also right. a nurse yes like and college. yeah i would like to acknowledge someone um henderson would have mentioned shade doris which is a shelter for battered women in montreal and we have marlene hewitt with us um, who is director of the women's shelter here in barbados marlene i don't know if you'll be kind enough to show your face but we have just ended 16 days of activism against um, domestic violence. So Pat, what is amazing about Henderson's summary is the, the, the vast range of topics that you touched on, um, including your, your sterling volunteer work with um, Shea Doris. Marlene, would you like to make a comment? I'm not hearing Marlene. Hi, but... good night. Okay. I'm having problems with my internet. That's why I'm off. I'm sorry if you can't see me. Hi, there it is again. I found the book exciting. Um, are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. I am Lost. hearing you. Yes, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. I don't know. I can hear you, Marlene. Yeah, I'm having problems with my internet. Okay, I'm having problems with my internet, that's why. But, but we can I, still hear you. I was listening quite closely. Okay, it, I, the book was fascinating. It, it reminds me of my time, and especially when she talked about climbing trees, I remember being in the golden apple tree and reading lengthy like, books. So it brought back a lot of memories to me. Thank you for writing the book and maybe I'll get a time to write a book as well. <laughs> I'm sure you will, like, Marlene. I'd like to take this opportunity to say hello to Tony and Haldane, cousins. <laughs> Martin. Hello. Your sister in law. Enid, hello. Oh. Valerie. Valerie. Daryl. Oh my God, Daryl. All my close people. It's this is very heartwarming. I am very, very, very touched. And Pat Erica is also here with us. Oh hi, Erica. Oh, the granddaughter just went on. Oh, Aunt Emma. Hi, Pat. Hello. Hi, Hi, my granddaughter, Emma. <laughs> Savannah is here as well. Oh, my Hi. gosh. I, as Hi. you know, I love the book. I loved your book. Thank it, you, thank you. It was so wonderful. Thank you, and thank you for everything you did for me when I was in Montreal. I love you. I love you. Bye-bye. Well, I'm getting all for clamped here. It's too much. Oh. Right, so that was my sister who I mentioned had 
attended Concordia mm -hmm. and uh, started her first year on crutches. And Pat was very instrumental in making sure that she got to her classes. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to just summarize. And this has been a very rich experience. Um, first of all, I, I want to say to everyone here in Barbados that the book is available at four locations, Cloister's Bookstore, Day's Bookstore, the University Bookstore, and that Free Spirit Supplies, which is Suzanne, um, Pat's goddaughter's um, store in Oystein. So it is available at four locations. Um, Henderson, I want to thank you. I sincerely for raising a number of salient points. Um, the legacy that Pat leaves, the, the legacy that is passed on to younger generations like her grandchildren. And this is the, the value of the written word that it stays with us and mm -hmm. others continue to be nourished by, by her own experiences. I particularly like, and I guess, Pat, you were probably surprised, but when we write, we don't necessarily fully grasp the import of what we are writing. I mean, Henderson points out a lot of things like afternoon tea, um, the, kit, the value of the kitchen garden, which, you know, it, our world is very cyclical, that that in this COVID world, in this COVID time is returning. Um, the fact that you laid your soul bare by talking about vitiligo. And uh, I am one who firmly believes that unless we reveal these things that we, we, we're all coping with things, whether it's vitiligo, whether it's HIV, whether it's mental illness, whether it's, um, you know, chronic ailments, you know, there was a time when we could not say cancer, it was a big C, but for laying your soul bare and talking so frankly about that and how you decided, well, to hell with it, I am who I am. And, you know, I am going to just live my life. Um, so Henderson, you really gave us a wonderful and very comprehensive um, perspective on various aspects of the book. And what is what I like about the book as you said, it's an easy read. It's it's the chapters are short, but very impactful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to encourage all of you, um, if you haven't bought it yet, um, Pat, I'm not sure where it is available in Montreal, but I know in Barbados, it, it's at four different bookstores, as I mentioned and um, for $35 each. And, you know, it, it, it will make a very good Christmas present. I want to thank, especially not just Henderson for his historical analysis and for taking time from his busy schedule at university to join us. But I also want to thank Suzanne Bell um, for being here because Suzanne's mother and Pat were best friends. Um, her mom is not well, but Suzanne, I want to thank you for taking time to 
at least allow Aunt Rita to hear what is going on. Very, it's very important because I know how much she means to Pat. So Actually, I need yes, I, 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 um, I, I'm very glad that we were able to, to include her in this in this presentation. So this is this is her bedtime now. So she isn't going to be saying much, but she's listening, and I, I know that she will, Angus will be able to discuss it tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, last, but by no means least, your son, Graham, Graham Bell of Bell Imagery, who has made this virtual um, launch possible. Um, I am not tech savvy, but this would not have been possible without Graham. We had several meetings and I'm very happy that there were at least a maximum of 47 participants from what I saw. And um, I want to thank all of you in Montreal. I have a friend who is listening in from Guyana. Um, there are several people from Barbados. So I, I want to thank each and every one of you from taking, for taking time from your busy schedule um, to be here, including Erica and her daughters. And um, Pat, um, as I said, you inspire me to write. And I, I look forward, to, I think we all look forward to reading your COVID chronicles. And um, as Henderson said, sharing our lived experiences and um and writing from a personal perspective is is so enriching thank you thank you tessa so i don't know if you have any final words but i i, I would, think i've said that all that needs to be said well it's been a wonderful evening i would say far beyond my wildest dreams and expectations. I'm extremely touched. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with um, Dr. Carter's overview of, of my writing. Um, thank you all for coming, good friends. I see my children, Brenda, Martin, um, Daryl, everybody. I'm so glad that Reed is there too. Helena, I went to school with you. Um, I hope I'm I'm not forgetting anybody. Kathleen, I see you. Davis yeah. Sullivan, Suzanne yeah. Belson, my good friends. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And um, I um, and thank you, Tessa. This it, it's been amazing. I am beyond thrilled. I think I'm going to have to keep my marbles working mm -hmm. and keep on writing. Hi there. <laughs> now I'm seeing Graham. Uh, Graham. Hi, Graham. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. We were driving Graham crazy, Tessa and I, really. <laughs> anyway, yeah. See, it turned out okay. So thanks, everybody, for coming. One last thing. One last thing. Right. I want to appeal to Dr. Carter to start that writing group. Yes. Uh, Maurice, I, I'm not sure how you 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 go about it or you know, but I I certainly would be the first to join um, because I I want to write. I love to write. I love the English language and its nuances. And um, so maybe if Maurice you could share with us like how y'all got started, whether you know there there has to be a common interest or whether you just get started um dr Hend dr carter i want to urge you i know how busy you are but i think a writing group here in barbados would be wonderful agreed 
and it would it would help us to um, deal with some of the violence that we're having in Barbados, especially getting a writing group among the persons who are 10, 11, 12 years old. That is where we have to start. And um, if we could do that, we would make an inroad into um, these problems that we're having. So I agree that, yes, we, could, we should start as early as primary school, get children into reading and writing. That is the foundation of any nation, that people are able to read and write and express their thoughts. And um, think, sorry. Yeah. Go I ahead. think you could have two writing groups, one mm -hmm. for younger people. Yes, yes. And the elderly have yes. a lot of memories mm -hmm. and um, things to contribute from their life that that have not been recorded and 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 you know saved and, and treasured. So, you know, yeah. The other thing is with the technology or young people are not reading books like before. Yeah. Everything is on an iPhone, they may be reading, but not necessarily reading, enriching and nourishing things. And I still think for me, holding a book in my hand is still my preferred mm -hmm. method. Um, so just a long- Thank you, thank you, thank you again, everybody for coming. You're welcome. Um, so I, I just wanna close and say good night to everyone. I wanna wish you a Merry Christmas or happy holidays or whatever you celebrate at this time. Cause I know we're dealing with a very diverse um, group here, but it is, has been a pleasure doing this for you, Pat. Thank and, you. And let me send you um, warm, I, I it, it's kind of cold, believe it or not, kind of chilly where I live, but at least it certainly is warmer than it would be in Montreal. So let me send you love and hugs and warmth from, from Barbados. Thank you, thank you. And thanks to everyone in. for being here this tonight. Thank you all for coming, I love you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Graeme. Have thanks, a good Graham. evening, everyone. Good night. Bye -bye. So, I close this session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. So, Graham, you can sleep well now. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yeah, that hurts. Yeah. Ah. Hi, yeah. Suzanne. Is your mom there? Yes, she is.